the truth. You can't handle the truth. What do all men power want? More power. My name is Gianluca Zanna. I was an Italian by birth and I became an American by choice. Our lives and freedoms are in danger. This is not a dream. If you're listening to this broadcasting, you are the resistance. Welcome to Love, Guns and Freedom. We're not afraid. You work for us. Here we go, guys. Another Sunday, another show. You're listening to Love, Guns and Freedom with Lucas Zanna on Talks 1340 AM and also United States.fm Network. You know, this show is, as I said, is not to divide, but to unite. Try to find uh, things that we pretty much agree. And then even if we don't agree, we need to try to find out what is really important out there. I mean, the point is, I think there is much more that we agree as, as, as American people. And we try to learn from each other because I'm here to learn. I tell you, I never really came here to try to say I know everything. Listen to me. First of all, I cannot even speak English sometimes when I'm tired. So my point is this one. I profess myself, even I'm not anymore uh, registered to any party since I burned my Republican card uh, one year ago or so, I profess myself that at least, let's say, a good 80% of my philosophical uh, socioeconomic beliefs, uh, political beliefs, they pretty much, you know, it's not a secret, you can see what I write on my lovegunsfreedom.com, i leaning towards the Libertarian Party. But as I said, I'm not registered Libertarian. And I like a lot of things about the Libertarian Party. I like very much the socioeconomic, you know, position, you know, the idea also that we own our body, that, uh, you know, there is a small government, very small government, and I really believe that. Probably, for me, the Libertarian position is the closest to the, our founding fathers. And this is not just me, it's just fact. Now, the only thing that uh, I still pretty much in... I don't want to use the word disbelief, but I do not agree, or at least make me perplexed, and I would like to learn, is the position about of the people to rightly free. And I agree for that. I want to rightly free between all the 50 states without being harassed, always having my Fourth Amendment with me uh, in, uh, as an American, or as a human being in general. You know. But the point is, do we still need to have borders? Why the borders are important? And uh, so according to many... Um, influence people that uh, they are into the libertarian party at least for what i learned from them they have a different position maybe i'm wrong maybe i don't know but i understand that the borders supposed not to be there and the people should be freely have the right to cross the borders whenever they like so i want to learn i want to understand and that's why today i have an expert at least a person that is very well educated and in this matter and i think he can help us out to understand better his name is jacob horneberger and uh, Jacob, are you there? Yes, I am. Good Lucas, morning. Nice to be here with you. Thank you very much. You know, and uh, you heard me briefly. You know, we are probably, and I don't know much about you, but I read about you. And uh, I, I think we have a lot of things that we share as, as Americans, as our value in our socioeconomics. But tell us a little bit about you, because I don't want to guess. I want to, first of all, introduce yourself. You're a, a smart person. You're a very well-educated person. By the way, you have an excellent Italian accent, better than my English <laughs> accent. Go ahead. Tell us about you a little bit. Uh, well, well I, I'm not that, uh, as smart as you make out to be, but thank you very much. Uh, I think we all live life in different levels of ignorance, and we, we try to lower that amount of ignorance. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I grew up on the Texas-Mexican border uh, uh, in Laredo, Texas, and uh, I was educated there in high school, and I went to college in Virginia, here where I live now, at Virginia Military Institute. I got a law degree at the University of Texas. And I practiced law for many years in Texas and then finally decided to leave the law practice to work for a libertarian economic foundation in New York. And then after a couple of years there, I decided to start my own libertarian foundation. And that's what I'm doing 25 years later, running the Future of Freedom Foundation, which people can find on the web at fff.org. Perfect. And also, I know that you have a book that, by the way, I'm going to order today on Amazon. It's called The Case for Free Trade and Open Immigration, correct? 
That's correct. We, we have taken a leading role in the area of open borders, open immigration, free trade, ever since our beginning 25 years ago. Perfect. You know, you, know, you heard my intro. You know, I'm here with an open mind to learn. And, you know, we are probably 99% of the things that we share the same value here. You know, I always uh, felt, even before I knew about uh, a party, I remember one time I was walking through, you know, I, I was uh, 30 days before becoming an American citizen, okay? And I was working through a gun show, and I always was into guns, even before I, when I was in Italy, I always was fascinated about uh, this right of the people to keep in their arms. And I, there, was a, there was like a little table from the Libertarian Party, and I said, wow, what is this Libertarian Party? And I started to read pretty much the different type of, uh, you know, philosophy and principles. I like this, I like this. And then, of course, there was a friend close to me saying, no, let, let them go, let them go, they are for drugs. And say, and you know, of course, I was—I could even be registered over there at the time. I was just thinking. I said, hey, I got a flyer, and I started to reflect about all the different points. And even when it comes down to drugs, you know, people are so brainwashed, in my opinion. It is not about drugs. It's about who owns our body, us or the state. What do you think about that? Do we agree about that? Absolutely. You, you know, know, there's no question about it. I—I I think the drug war and drug laws are. One of the things that either make you a libertarian or don't make you a libertarian. And like you say, there's various issues in the libertarian philosophy that are sometimes difficult for people to understand. I had trouble when I was first getting into libertarianism of understanding certain aspects, but as you reflect on them, you digest them, you think about them, you, you finally really realize that the libertarians are right. But but in the meantime, I think the drug war is the real lit, one of the litmus tests that divides libertarians from non-libertarians. Yes, you know, and that's what I show you where I'm coming from. You know, that for me, I have a lot of people that uh, that say, I don't even want to call them friends, but they agree with me on many aspects. But when I touch the word drugs, and by the way, I don't even take aspirin. I'm so clean, you have no idea. I hate even the word aspirin. I had, All I do, I drink wine when I'm sick, okay? So... Uh, the bottom line, I'm not for drugs. That means I'm not saying that you should be able to, to, I mean, I invite you to take drugs. But the point, my point is, if the government can tell me what I can eat or what can I grow or what I cannot grow, eat or drink, at that point, I do not own my body. I am a slave, as simple as that. That's what's really, for me, the, the most important thing I learned about the libertarian philosophy. You know, So that's we have it in common. At least you know that I am, uh, in this area, pretty much libertarian. Now... The, gu the guns issue, I mean, it's no issue. I love the libertarian. It's the real Second Amendment, the way it's supposed to be, correct? That is correct. So, the right to keep and bear arms is as fundamental as the right to ingest harmful and destructive substances. That's yeah. what freedom's all about. Exactly. And, of course, you know, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It doesn't mean that there is after subchapter, you know, comma, and some other different variations. I mean, our founding fathers made it pretty clear. So the idea of permits and licenses for what's supposed to be a right it doesn't apply. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a right. It would be a privilege. So we agree also on that. Now, social, socioeconomic, you know, give us a little bit briefly the philosophy uh, and the principles of the Libertarian Party when it comes down to economics, the real true free market. Yeah, I mean, when we talk about free enterprise or free markets, what that means for libertarians is economic enterprise that's free of government control or regulation. If it's economic activity that's regulated or controlled or directed, then it's not free enterprise by definition. We're talking about enterprise that is totally free of government control, direction, and regulation. So libertarians believe that you have the right, because you own your own body, as you said, to, in, to engage in occupations and professions in the attempt to sustain your life uh, without a license or a permit. Because as you pointed out, the right to sustain your life is not a privilege that the government gives you. It's, it's a fundamental, God-given, natural right. And as part of that right, then you have a right to engage in economic enterprise, enter into trades with other people, mutually beneficial economic exchanges, and in the process of doing that to accumulate wealth. And then you, that brings up the idea that you have a right to keep the fruits of your own earnings. It's, it's your property, and therefore you have a right to do whatever you want with it. Donate it to charity, hoard it keep it, invest it, spend it, save it, that that's another aspect of human freedom, is deciding for yourself what to do with your own money. Completely, 100% with you. I mean, this is, for me, probably the most important of all of it, you know, because, you know, there is, you know the, the saying, 
You know, if the government tax you uh, 100%, you're a slave. If they tax you 50%, you're a 50% 50, uh, 50 slave, half slave. And that's the sad thing, you know. We changed so much from the beginning of this republic. Now we are transformed in this sort of a soft, uh, I don't even call it any more soft. I mean, this is completely now a hardcore socialist form of government that pretty much uses coercion to control every aspect of your life and force you to buy products against your will, like Obamacare and many other things. And more important, to tax the hell out of you just because you own a thing. I mean, property taxes is still something that I have a heart attack every year when I have to pay mine. It's not just the money itself, it's the principle. That nothing really changed since the time of kings and lords. Before I used to pay my tax for my little uh, hut or home to the king, and now I have to pay to a bunch of, uh, of, of uh, people behind the deck excuse me, behind the desk, they pretty much they have this power to steal my money, to redistribute my money. So I, I completely agree with your position on, on, on this one. Now, come down to the core of this uh, interview, at least the things that uh, I, I do not understand and I need to understand, you know. The position of, let's say, is there an official position for the Libertarian Party about borders and immigration or everybody has a different ideas? Well, I, I used to serve on the platform committee of the Libertarian Party. I served three terms. Mm -hmm. And, um, and of course, the Libertarian movement is much larger than just the Libertarian Party. The Libertarian Party is the political representative of the movement. But then there's a lot of think tanks and educational foundations and so forth. And you're right. There are some Libertarians that, that favor closed borders and, and uh, regulated borders, but they're truly the minority. And when I served on the platform committee of the Libertarian Party, it was very clear that libertarians favor completely open immigration, uh, free trade, no controls at all on the, on the movements of people across borders. Uh, so uh, I would say that that really is a core element of the libertarian philosophy, especially because it is the only position that is consistent with the libertarian non-aggression principle, mm -hmm. which is the core principle that guides libertarianism. And okay. that says that, that you, it is morally wrong to ever initiate force against other human beings. So you can't murder, rape, steal. But otherwise, you should be free to live your life any way you want making whatever choices you want as long as your conduct is peaceful. Okay. Uh, no murder, rape, and theft. And so clearly the right to cross borders, to improve one's life, to enter into mutually beneficial transactions with others falls within that non-aggression principle. Okay. Very, okay. At least I understand now this is pretty much the, let's say, the official position, at least majority of the libertarian uh, people uh, believe that. And that's important because, you know, I'm learning this. Now, question. You know, we believe... Uh, that uh, both believe, and I'm speaking for myself, that we have we supposed to be a republic in our founding governments. I mean, founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, Bill of Rights, and Constitution. Even of course, with their flaws. I mean, the Constitution. I believe, uh, even in my ignorance as as, as a new American, I'm still studying it. But I, I really believe they could have been done better. But it's still the best thing we have. Now, do we believe that these are the documents, pretty much, that uh, differentiate us from all the rest of the world? I mean, I, I don't remember in Italy or Europe, no nation has the Bill of Rights. Do we agree on that? These are our foundations. Absolutely. And, and I think you put it well when you say that you, when you think of the Constitution, you have to think of the Declaration of Independence as well, because the philosophy that went into both documents was essentially the same. And it was the, the accepted philosophy among most Americans after the break with, from, from Great Britain. Okay, perfect. So this is for me that the core of values that, the, let's say, the bricks, the stones that this country was founded upon and uh, differ pretty much make us different from uh, the rest of, of the world in this uh, human experience experiment called these, these United States of America, not the, these United States. Now, the reality is one, though. The rest of the world, let's say the average person out there, I'm speaking for people that I know, for example, in Italy, okay? I don't even want to go that far. I'm not even talking for people from south of the border. They have no clue about what is the Declaration of Independence. They have no clue what it is the Bill of Rights. They don't even know what, why, I have still friends in Italy, they ask me, why do you carry a gun? What is your problem, man? I mean, that's pretty much their attitude, okay? Let the government have the guns. They are the pros. Think about that. That's the state of mind. Complete, complete slaves since they were born, since the time of the Romans, and then they went through the popes, the Middle Ages, nothing really changed. So the rest of Europe, besides few exceptions. Now think about it. We have 7 billion people out there, okay? Plus or minus. And uh, 
I don't say everybody wants to come here, but let's say a lot of people, they like the idea, I want to come to America, okay? But everybody at the same time say, let's go. What do we do? All right. Well, first of all, let's let's get back to the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. uh, we start we start there. Yes. And and Je Jefferson says that every person is endowed with fundamental God-given rights, natural mm -hmm. rights. Well, notice he's not saying these are just for Americans. He's saying that this is all human beings have the right to to live their lives, to have liberty, to pursue happiness. So that applies not just to Americans, but to foreigners as well. Everybody, Italians, everybody's got the right to sustain their lives through labor, to enter into mutually beneficial transactions. That's what liberty encompasses, associate with others, speak out against the government, uh, and to pursue happiness each in his own way. Mm -hmm. Now, people do that in different ways. Uh, many people come to the United States to say because hey, there's economic opportunity here and they get jobs with people who are willing to hire them. All of this is mutual and consensual uh, that there are American employers who love hiring uh, immigrants because they traditionally immigrants love to work hard. They have a very strong work ethic. And so uh, there's also apartment complexes that, that love to rent housing to immigrants. They, they make money off doing something like that. Uh, or you have people like Costco and, and other grocery stores and so forth. They love selling things to immigrants. They don't care who they're selling to. They're making money. Mm -hmm. And so you've got this, this, this entire range of economic activity that doesn't depend on what your citizenship is. It's irrelevant. Okay. But even today, when you walk around, you don't know who the Americans, who the, who the American citizens are, and who aren't. You you may suspect. I mean, I can listen to your accent and say, "Huh, I wonder," but I'm not going to sit there and say, "Show me whether you're an American or not. Prove it," because I don't care. And most to most people, they don't care. They just get all hyped up because they they read the statistics in the newspaper that there's 10 million illegal immigrants here. Uh, but like, who cares? It, it really doesn't matter on an individual basis because when you transact with people on an individual basis, you don't ask for their citizenship. No, I understand. Once you're here, and you know, at least it's not about the accent that makes you an American. First of all, you know, I didn't jump a fence. I went through a process. I went to an embassy. I went through, I pretty much, uh, you know, ask, ask for a visa, and uh, it wasn't a right for me, it was about a privilege, I was born in Italy, I didn't ask, oh, the, I want to be there, I'll be there, no, I politely, like tomorrow I come to your door of your home, I'm sure you have a door, and I knock at the door and say, can I come in for a drink, and you can say yes or no, that's, after all, that's your home, you know, and the same way I came to America in the same way, now, once we're here, and I don't care, about your accent, uh, you follow this process. I believe that we should have all the same right uh, in a way that uh, I don't care which state or which country you're from, the famous melting pot, we have a chance to be here equally without specific, you know, um, not specific ethnic group should be a privilege, uh, have the privilege, you know, that the way used to be. Now the quarter are kind of different, but regardless, what you're saying, there is for me something that I'm a little concerned. When you have, uh, you don't know, the person or the millions of people that they cross the border, they come with different cultural background, okay? Like for example, without even going to the south of the border uh, people, uh, like people from the south of America, I'm talking about Italy, okay? A place that so people can say, oh, you're a racist. No, I'm talking about my Italian brothers and sisters. They have no idea what is a bill of rights, the difference between a right and a privilege, okay? They have no idea what is the Second Amendment because it doesn't exist. They have no idea what is the First Amendment because it doesn't exist. Because even when you want to open a legal newspaper, you must ask the permit to the judge. So, with the type of a be a cultural background uh, you meet in this, in, this, in this society, in this country called this United States of America, uh, millions of people, and then they have uh, the right to vote pretty much soon. And uh, are you not afraid that uh, from a republic we will transform ourselves in a democracy, something that I'm sure you hate this word, because pretty much means that 51% of the mob can try to steal our rights using the coercion of the government. And, uh, and more important also, how can you sustain this uh, out of control uh, number of people when we know very well that the welfare system is alive and well, not just today, the last 60, 70 years at least, and that will pretty much uh, destroy every benefit or everything anyway and will completely make us more slave. We have to pay more taxes. So my first issue is, uh, 
and a limited and controlled number of people that cannot assimilate and understand the principle that we are talking here, me and you, about the foundation of this republic. They cannot be able to vote. And number two, how can we sustain every new immigrant or everybody who wants to jump the fence with the welfare system that we have right now? Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, keep in mind, first of all, that, that libertarians don't oppose borders as such. Um, we simply say, I mean, we love borders. I mean, we simply say people should be free to cross borders without interference. Uh, for example, there's a border between Maryland and Virginia. Mm -hmm. And every day people cross back and forth. The, the government doesn't keep track of who's crossing back and forth. Nobody cares. Uh, but the border remains. But when you cross into Virginia, you're subject to Virginia laws. When you cross into Maryland, you're subject to Maryland laws. So when people come to the United States, they they are subject to the laws of the United States. You know, that doesn't necessarily have to translate into citizenship. I mean, th th a lot of times people combine that in their minds that just because a person comes here to live or work or tour or whatever, that that automatically means he's going to become an American citizen and start to vote. Not so. That you can have entire groups of people coming here to work like seasonal workers returning to Mexico after the, the season's over, that there's absolutely no reason why that has to translate into citizenship. And, and for example, I have a friend who's a Japanese uh, citizen. She's been here for, I think, 25 years. And she works here. She teaches Japanese in a school. And she remains a Japanese citizen. And, and that's fine. There's a lot of Americans living in Mexico, have retired in Mexico. They retain their American citizenship. So in order to, to change the laws and stuff, you obviously have to become a citizen. Now, whatever rules they want to put on for becoming an American citizen, I don't care. That's not important to me. They, if they want to make it very stringent, do testing and see if somebody understands the Bill of Rights and the Constitution before becoming a citizen, fine. But the fact that somebody just wants to come here as a tourist or to work here for a year or to work here for 25 years and not become a citizen, I say that's fine too. Now you raise another issue of what about the unlimited numbers of people that would come into the United States? Can, can, can the United States handle such a thing? Well, we've got the laws of supply and demand uh, that, that, are, that are part of, of a market economy. And, it, you know, it's easy to imagine this scenario where the whole world comes to the United States, but the law of supply and demand prevent that. That as people move into an area, we all know this, the prices start going up. The prices of housing, the prices of food, the prices of automobiles, the cost of living starts going up. That makes it extremely difficult for new people to move in. I mean, right now, for example, here in the United States, we have open borders between all the states. It didn't have to be that way. The, the founding fathers could have put immigration controls on the states. Yet we don't live in fear that everybody's going to move to New York City suddenly or everybody's going to move to Montana suddenly. Why? Because people have different interests. And the fact is that people around the world, a lot of them love their countries. I've talked to people in Mexico that said we would never leave our country, Mexico, for the United States, even if it was open borders. It's very, very difficult to move to a new country, as, as you can attest. You, get, you have to learn the language. You have to get a job. There's discrimination against you. So the number of people that would come to the United States with open borders would, would entirely depend on the, on the factors of supply and demand. And as prices start rising, you would see a diminution of that demand. Okay, Jacob, one question. By the way, listeners, you know, this is a very important conversation, trying to learn from each other. My name is Luca Zanna. You're listening to Love, Guns, and Freedom on Talks 1340 AM. And here we have a special guest, Jacob Hornberger, and we're discussing a little bit about different positions about open borders and immigration. Coming from somebody like myself that I can hear from my New York accent, and I'm kidding, I, I was born in Rome, okay, so I'm a former immigrant. But the position is pretty much this one also. Uh, Jacob, uh, we mentioned before welfare. You know, me and you, we know that we don't agree on welfare. I mean, we agree on welfare. We don't want a welfare because welfare means uh, somebody else has to pay for it. But at the same point, we understand that it's still in this reality that we are living. Now, if an immigrant, I don't care, legal or not illegal right now, they pretty much can benefit from different programs. That means more taxes we are forced to pay. How do we solve this? Because if you say everybody can come here, so everybody can pretty much, with the right knowledge, uh, suck in, or at least tap in, excuse me, tap in into these programs. Welfare, it's here and alive. How can we sustain that? 
Well, there's, there's nothing inherent um, why uh, immigrants or foreigners should be entitled to any welfare. Uh, the, the laws can easily be changed. And in fact, it's my understanding that immigrants are not entitled to go on welfare, at least for a certain period of time. But look, look, as libertarians, we stand for certain moral principles. And one of those moral principles is that people are endowed with certain fundamental inherent rights to pursue happiness, to sustain their lives. Mm -hmm. Most people come here to work. Now, granted, let's say there's 5% come here to get on the welfare state. As libertarians, we oppose the welfare state. We say it's morally wrong for the state to take money from one person and give it to another person. Well, do we want to, as libertarians, abandon our principles uh, because the statists have imposed this welfare state that, it, that seems to be attracting, let's say, 5% of immigrants? I don't think so. We have to stand for our principles. We don't want to punish the 95% by prohibiting them from coming into the United States because 5% are going to go on welfare. There's no justice, justice in that position. There's no morality in that position. As libertarians, we have to continue standing for the moral principle that people have the right to cross borders and focus our attention on getting rid of the wrongdoing, which is the welfare state. Now, if statists say, well, we're going we're gonna to put everybody that comes here on welfare, my hunch is that gonna, people are going to be so upset over that, that they're funding all these foreigners, that that will be the day when they start abolishing the welfare state. So we should not try to protect the status, uh, protect their welfare state system from the strains that come with immigration. We as libertarians should instead say, we believe that the exercise of fundamental rights must continue and you status must figure out a solution for it. If that's removing uh, foreigners from the welfare state, fine. It, it's, it's highly destructive. It's not good to put people on welfare. Uh, but in the process, we libertarians have to remain with our principles by continuing to call for the exercise of, of genuine freedom. Okay, you know, this is exactly, unfortunate. I understand what you're saying. The only thing, me, why, I, my opinion, reality is that we are pretty much, nobody is going to, unless we really have a peaceful revolution, I want to leave it like that. I don't think this welfare system is going to go away very far, very, very quickly, because the people, they are so like on drugs, you know, it's just too deep, in my opinion. So, I understand what you're saying, I understand your principles, it's just, uh, I, I have a heart to believe that uh, the welfare may go away. I Meanwhile, we may have... Uh, you know, in a limited number of, uh, I call it, you know, probably you don't like the term, illegal aliens, but at the same time, and that's the legal term, by the way, according to the laws that we have on the book. But my question is another one, you know, we have uh, an identity, at least we want to preserve our identity, as, uh, as we said before, with the founding documents that we set. If there is no assimilation, how can we preserve this identity? And the reason why I'm saying that, you know, I didn't like the fact I had to wait seven years, you know, and paperwork and going through long lines and paying a lot of fees. And but I did it, and I was trying to do it in my best, uh, you know, way I could do it to try also to assimilate, and taking the time to assimilate to the to, to the to the principle of this country. At least that was my intention. But now, if you have somebody that pretty much can come here, and as you said, there is no no checking, you know, just everybody can come here. And after all, you know very well now. And I'm not saying that the Libertarian Party is in this on this position, but both parties they want to exploit the the immigrants. Uh, they want to pander for them because they want to pretty much register to their parties. The Democrats for a reason, the Republicans for another one. And it's not going to be about uh, sharing the values of our founding fathers. It's going to be mostly, especially for the Democratic Party, more more welfare they want to give. Now, how can we uh, have an assimilation if there is not some sort of a process? that uh, we know at least who's coming here and that we can give them the time to assimilate. Well, you know, when you talk about a national identity, the, the, re the real national identity of America is liberty. I mean, that, that's, that's what our founding principles were. For, mm -hmm. for the first hundred years of American history, we had open borders. We had open immigration. The, the immigration station at, at Ellis Island was nothing more than check for tuberculosis. But if you didn't have tuberculosis, you were automatically in, whether you could speak English or not. They didn't care. Uh, they didn't say, well, are you going to assimilate? Do you fill out these forms? We need to see where you're going to go live. Are you going to have a job? None of that. Uh, the, the, the whole philosophy was freedom. 
and and that was of course why we got the the Statue of Liberty from from France. Now that meant that a lot of people with different philosophies came into this country. Uh, and you're right, freedom is dangerous. Sometimes you attract people with with socialist philosophies, and there were certainly a lot of them from from Italy, for example, that that came in with socialist philosophy. That's one of the risks of a free society. Mm -hmm. But but we want to protect the freedom, even if it's risky, because the denial of freedom is so much worse. I understand. And now look look at the culture of America. You know, you can't tell me it's one culture. If you go to New York City, that's one culture. If you go to New Orleans, Louisiana, that's more like a French culture. You go to my hometown of Laredo, that's a Mexican culture. In fact, in Laredo, this, this might surprise you, about 25 or 30 percent of the population cannot speak English. Jacob, I'm not, you know, I'm not talking about culture. You know, I have my own wine, my pasta, and sometimes when I'm in my home, I speak uh, more than one language with my family. That's not the point. The point is about here, as you said, the right word. You know, there were socialists uh, from Italy. They are like uh, socialists from Mexico. They are communists from different parts of the world. They pretty much, uh, they infiltrated, they already infiltrated this country. And there is a point that, uh, you know, do we let everybody in? Uh, as you, you answered to me, of course, you gave me your answer. Now, I have a question for you. You ever heard about uh, the movement of the Azatlan, the, the, the Mexican Reconquista? You know, there was the, the big war, you know, and there was the, the Treaty of Guadalupe and uh, all the part of the Southwest, pretty much, uh, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, part of California, was won during this war, and America owns it. Uh, and then there is this movement, this cultural movement, it is not just a political movement, to pretty much retake the Southwest uh, through uh, repopulation and uh, in voting. You ever heard about that? Oh, yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm familiar with it. So. And um, I, I think that when you see movements like that, it, 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 should, it should make you happy that you live in a free society. Mm -hmm. Because an, an unfree society is where people are not permitted to, to have such movements. And if, if you look back at what these people are talking about, the, the Mexican War, I mean, clearly they, 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 there is justification for what they're saying. There's no doubt that the U.S. just stole the, the northern half of Mexico. The uh, that President Polk had offered to buy the northern half of Mexico, and and the Mexican officials had said our country's not for sale. So he just concocted a war down at Brownsville, Texas, uh, that that provoked the, the Mexicans into having this war. And at the end of the war, they ended up getting the northern half and paying off Mexico for it. Mm -hmm. So we essentially really did steal the northern half of this country, and and we're talking about. Texas, which at that time had become an independent nation because of its revolution, but New Mexico and Arizona and California, those are all parts of Mexico. Now, okay, so this movement says we want to we want to start this movement to secede this part of the country, maybe return it to Mexico. And it's ridiculous because we all know that's not going to happen as a practical matter. That was settled by the Civil War when the South tried to secede from from the Union. Uh, if, if another part of the country were to secede involuntarily, we know that federal troops would be sent there. So these people can advocate whatever they want, and they can make their arguments. That's what a free society is all about. Do I live in fear that all of a sudden California is going to be returned to Mexico? No, I don't lose any sleep over that at all. No, no I'm probably, you're right, you know, it's not going to happen. By the way, I am all for the rights of the state to uh, voluntarily join and voluntarily succeed. I mean, that was the pretty much the basic uh, principle till, of course, Abraham Lincoln smashed that principle. So we agree on that. The only point is different. You know, I've been living in California my first few years as a fresh immigrant. And I realized that the state, the way it is, and there it will be, is pretty much uh, projected towards civil war, you know. And uh, I, wa I, I watch videos, I've been living on, you know, through people, and see that there is no assimilation. There is no this sort of, of a free spirit or free society. There is pretty much now hate, I'm telling you. And uh, I'm sorry, you know, I would like to share with you something that probably, uh, maybe you already know, but this is coming from different uh, figures of uh, the California movement of this uh, Azatlan or Mecha or La Raza. The problem that they want, first of all, uh, use, and they are using it, all the resources, all the tax dollar of, uh, the, they call them white men, I'm not calling that, to pretty much for their agenda. And that's scary right there, because unfortunately the, the welfare system is uh, alive and well in California, and uh, the illegal immigrants, 
they are they're voting and i'm not saying that they're already saying that and uh, and they're voting for more of that but let me play this one for you one second Obledo was a founding member of maldes the mexican-american legal defense and education fund Obledo stated on a radio talk show california is going to be a hispanic state and anyone who doesn't like it should leave they ought to go back to europe Same we're going to take over all the political institutions of California. In five years, the Hispanics are be going to be the majority population of the state. You also made the statement that California is going to become a Hispanic state, and if anyone doesn't like it, they should leave. Did you say that? I did. They ought to go back to Europe. And you don't think that we hear that with the right like stuff Mexico that you are... And then, and then the law of the land will be open the borders, let everybody in, burn down billboards, shut up anybody you don't agree with, that once the Hispanics take over, then we're not going to have freedom of speech anymore, you're going to tell us what's okay to say, you're going to tell us when we're crying fire in a crowded theater. You know, it's one thing to cry fire in a crowded theater, it's another thing to set a fire, which you're about to do. Anyway, there's a just a little part. There is much more. I'm telling you, I, uh, I like the idea, the principle that we should have, you know, pretty much the freedom to travel. Uh, but the reality is, uh, as an American, and, you know, people, you, you say something important before. Say again, you know, like the, before we started the show. Hey, you're still in jobs. Uh, tell me the part. I like that line. Please go ahead. <laughs> well, I was making a joke about you coming from Italy and stealing jobs from Americans. You're stealing the talk show host job from America. Good, good. First of all, I, I don't get paid. Oh, well, don't worry about it. <laughs> Nobody would get my job. No, but, but uh, here's, here's the real thing about immigrants Luca yes it's it's not that that you guys steal jobs from Americans that I'm concerned about it's that you come here and you marry Americans and so you're stealing potential <laughs> spouses from America all right you're you right see? on that but guess what I'm also not married okay I'm single I'm a monk so don't worry about that <laughs> So anyway, but let me tell you this one. Uh, you know, this is important, you know, and you made a good point. You know, you're still in jobs from Americans. And I, I agree with you. You know, that's why I believe there is a process. The country should be able to, uh, to, you know, like, for example, you know, you come to my home. Okay. First of all, I have a, I have a door. Do you have a door at your, at your house or you have open, open, open door? Everybody can come in. You have a, I have a fence gate and machine guns on top of the towers. Do you have a door <laughs> at least? <laughs> no. You have not. Do you have a door or not? You live uh, in in a, in a tent like the Indians without <laughs> doors, or you live in a house with a door and lock? Tell me. No, no I understand the point you're making, but it's fallacious. Okay, but okay. It's, that was just see, the point. I have a door. Okay, so you want to yeah. come to my house? I would like to see you. You pick in. Oh, it's you. Oh, I, oh, very good, man. Come here. Come here, Jacob. I got some wine for you. Let's have a drink. Great. Now, same story for me. When I came here. I went through a process that right or wrong what it is, the process at least intentionally was studied to be sure that I didn't come here to be a burden, okay? I had to prove myself that I could self-sustain myself. I was able to at least take care of myself and uh, I had skills that um, I was not going to, in, the, in, in the, the quota that they needed, this nation needed, I was not going to interfere with the, with the average American out there in the, lively, in the livelihood. That was the point. So I follow a process and I earned my uh, status of a naturalized American through a process that was pretty much dictated by the law of this country, okay? And I, use, I, hate, the word, I, I hate to use the word dictated, but at least set by the laws of this country. That's the point. So I don't feel like uh, I steal anything because I follow the process of this country was pretty much tried to regulate immigration. Now, when I am here, for example, I have now, let's say, I remember, many kids, many new guys, new people, young people, excuse me, uh, want to start to, to be in the, in the job business, okay? Like to do these uh, minimum wages jobs. And I remember in California, I have a lot of friends that they're older, they have their sons, and they could, these, these kids, they couldn't find almost any more of these uh, $8 an hour or whatever work. Are you cleaning a gun, by the way? Sound like you, you're making some gun cleaning there. But uh, anyway, so the problem is, I realized that uh, it's very hard to compete especially with now with this uh, minimum wages job for an average um, young person when you have now all these jobs taken by uh, people that uh, they will take for any price. So my point is, I don't think uh, you steal a job or you steal an American job, at least if you do it in a way that uh, you follow a process that you, you're supposed to be part of, of, of to the quarter that they want to give you in, in allowing to come here. So that's my idea. But I want to give you the floor, you know, 
I really appreciate, by the way, to have an, this conversation with me because, as I said, we have so many things we agree. This is the only thing, really, that I still I have a hard time to digest and probably I won't. But at the same time, you know, I want to have differences of opinion on this show. This is exactly the purpose. And I invite anybody who disagree with me to be here and I would like to put you in front of the line because the, the show is about learning from each other, or at least to have an open mind to try to do that. So I want to give you the floor and whatever you want to say. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate that. You know, I was only joking about the stealing the jobs thing because that's what you always hear about immigrants. They steal jobs from Americans. It, it's really a ridiculous notion that nobody can steal a job from another person. You go in and you, nobody has a right to a job. You go into an employer and you say, I'm willing to work for you. And if the employer wants to hire you and he wants to fire somebody else, you haven't stolen a job. You've, you've entered into a contract with an employer. Nobody has a right to say, I have this position and you, you can't fire me or you can't get rid of me. But actually, immigrants produce jobs. And historically, that's why standards of living always rise when you have open immigration. Because immigrants come in with a vitality, they create jobs, they start businesses, they'll go and work for sub-minimal wages, and uh, that creates economic prosperity for other people in society. The, the immigrant has to buy food, he has to get a car, he has to buy gasoline, he needs clothes. That produces jobs in these sectors where the, the people that used to be picking the crop, for example, are now over there selling the, the used car to the immigrant. Mm -hmm. I, so there's a division of labor that works in a, in a market economy like that. Now, on your on your the tape you played, I, I found that very interesting, almost amusing. I mean, I, I had a great big s smile on my face actually when I heard it. You know, the Hispanics are taking over America and stuff. I mean, look, I grew up in Laredo, as I as I indicated earlier. I mean, I know what it's like to live under Hispanic rule, if that's what they want to call it. Uh, 90, I would say 98% of Laredo is Hispanic. You walk into a, a I, in fact, I did an informal survey one time. I walked around at McDonald's uh, to see how many conversations were in Spanish, like over lunch. And all of them, every single one was in Spanish. Well, you see, none of that bothers me, that, that, that the fact that somebody happens to be of Hispanic origin, it's running a city as the mayor of the city council, it, it doesn't bother me at all. It, it goes back, the real problem, the challenge we face as libertarians, which is what we started out this program as, is how do we educate people to a level where they want to be free in that society because let's face it, status come in all citizenships. I mean, you come here to Virginia and most people here are not libertarians. So the, the immigrant's mindset is no different from your average American's mindset. The question, the challenge we have is how do we maintain our principles as libertarians and reach a critical mass of people who want a free society? And a free society meaning no more welfare state, no more warfare state, no more standing armies and CIA and NSA and surveillance schemes. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge we face. Yep. And and it's it's shows like this. And, and I really do appreciate the way you handle this show. You know, I can see that you're concerned about this issue of, of immigration, but you're seeking, you're exploring, you're asking, you're having me on your show. This is how I change. I think we change the course of the direction of a country. People listening to your show, they're not all going to agree with me. I understand that. But 25 years ago, Luca, nobody agreed with me on drug legalization either. Mm -hmm. And now that is now an issue on the table. There's it's a reputable position. People are taking it. That's the power of ideas. Yes. And that's what shows like this can accomplish. They can shift people's thinking, whether they're immigrants. Uh, Americans or whoever. But my point people exactly is this. I, I don't want people to think like I do. I just want to people use their brain, do the researches. I want to bring you a, a spectrum of different philosophies and then you start to tap into your brain and use your logic and your heart. This is pretty much the purpose of the show. I'm not here to try to tell you, oh, I'm right, he's wrong. No, I say, this is what I believe and according to my facts. And then I invite every one of you listeners to find out your sources and verify your, your facts and make your opinion about it. Now, before you, when you said, you know, uh, I'm not concerned about uh, the color of people, if they speak with an accent or not. I mean, I, when I see, for example, I have a lot of friends that they are Hispanic. I don't even call them Hispanic. I call them an American with a brown uh, skin. And I am, they call me an American with a white skin and a big 
uh, Italian accent, but still, we are Americans. I don't look at that like, uh, uh, you know, oh my God, uh, is a different color for me, I'm concerned. No, for me, it's the actions that I'm concerned. It's not about their accent or maybe the language. Of course, I must tell you something, you know, and this is coming from somebody, as you can hear it, my English is way far from perfect, even I'm trying to study. Uh, and when I go out, though, in public, I think it, nobody's uh, forcing me, but I do it. Even when I am with my Italian friends, we speak Italian for the simple reason why, because I want to like to, in front of a public that they don't speak my language, I would like to, first of all, feel integrated. I don't want to feel like I am uh, doing something disrespectful, but is it just me? And I have a lot of friends that they are um, Hispanic, as you call them, and they very, very, very much believe in what I believe, and I believe in America, and they believe, of course, in the Constitution, Bill of Rights, and Declaration of Independence. So I don't ever judge people from their accent of by their color, but their actions. And now, speaking about actions, before I leave you, I know probably this is something that uh, is still something you think is an extreme case, but when you go to California, and I witness things that probably maybe even you, Laredo, witness, I don't know, I realize that we are in danger. And for me, it's more than just immigration. This is a planned invasion. Listen to this. Here, Augustine Sabata, Information Minister of the Brown Berets, the foot soldiers of the Aslan movement. This was on July 4th, 1996, at an Independence Day rally and celebration at the Federal Building in Westwood, where illegal aliens and the Communist Progressive Labor Party attacked Americans celebrating Independence Day. I was thinking about the Brown Berets. We're here today to show L.A., show the minority people here, the Anglo-Saxons, that we are here, the majority. We're here to stay. We do the work in this city. We take care of the spoiled brat children. We clean their offices. We pick the food. We do the manufacturing in the factories of L.A. We are the majority here, and we are not going to be pushed around. We're here in Westwood. This is the fourth time we've been here in the last two months to show white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, L.A., the few of you who remain, that we are the majority, and we claim this land is ours. It's always been ours, and we're still here. And uh, none of this talk about deporting. If anybody's going to be deported, it's going to be you. Go back to TV Valley, you scud! Go back to Woodland Hills! Go back to Boston! Go back to the Plymouth Rock! Go them! Get out! We are the future! You're the tired! Go on! We have beaten you! Leave like beaten rats! You old white people, it is your duty to die. Even their own ethicists say that they should die. That they have a duty to die. They're taking up too much space, too much air. We are the majority in L.A. There's over 7 million Mexicans in L.A. County alone. We are the majority. And you're going to see every day more and more of it as we, we manifest, as our young people grow up and graduate from high school, go on to college and start taking over the society. Our people are the, the vast majority of people under the age of 15 years. Years old. Right now, we're already controlling those elections. Whether it's through violence or nonviolence, through love of having children, we're going to take over. This is our plan. This is Mexico. They're the pilgrims on, on our land. Go back to the. Okay, Jacob, what do you think about this, uh, Mr. Agustin Sebada? By the way, it's, it was 1996, uh, this video, I guess. Uh, now it's 2015. Things got much worse. Last time I went to Los Angeles, I thought I was in some sort of, I don't know, escaping from New York movie in some part of the city, especially if you don't speak Spanish. And I'm sorry, you know, this is uh, reality. I'm not trying to play it low or high. It is uh, the way it is. They look at you if you are not. Uh, normally when I get 10, by the way, I, I look pretty dark, but, uh, you know, I don't sound Spanish enough. And they look at you kind of weird sometimes. I feel, what do you think about this uh, little audio clip? Well, there, there's always going to be racial strife in any society. I, I, don't, I, I probably don't need to tell you that there were people saying the same things about Italians that were flooding America's shores in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. In fact, there were very many derogatory things that were said about Italians, uh, including Italians from the southern part of the country, who were considered, I think, lower class than Italians from the northern part of the country. Mm -hmm. And the same thing about the Irish, I mean, the, the Catholics. Uh, so this, this is not a new phenomenon. And, and when you take over the northern half of Mexico and not expect there's, there's going to be problems um, uh, 100 years later, 150 years later, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's kind of idealistic. But 
there, you can look in other parts of the country, like where I grew up in Laredo. You didn't see any of this type of thing. Of course, it was 90% um, uh, Hispanic, 95%. But you look at San Antonio. San Antonio is a wonderful town where Hispanic and Anglo cultures have melded together. That doesn't mean that there's not bigots on both sides in, within the community or in Texas. Uh, this is always, you're always going to have racial bigots. You're always going to have the other side of the bigotry saying you know, that's creating problems. So it, none of that concerns me. It, it's, you know, that saying, oh, his banks are going to take over. It's a lot of fear mongering. I, I, I don't I don't really worry about it. I, I, you know, I mean, I look, look say at that. this. They're look at saying this that. Way, I, I didn't say right that. Now, you know? There's a million Americans living in Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, more than a million. They don't speak in, uh, Spanish. They refuse to learn the, the language, most of them. They only hang out among themselves. They are not assimilating. Uh, they, they eat uh, hamburgers instead of enchiladas. Well, so what? They, they root for the Dallas Cowboys. They retain their American citizenship. I say, so what? They leave them alone. They're, they're in Mexico. Okay, they don't need to assimilate. That's what freedom's about. I agree. Um, no, Jacob, I agree with you. And I'm not saying that you must assimilate in everything. And that's not the point. The point when we start to have an agenda that becomes a violent agenda, becomes a political agenda to pretty much... Uh, uh, these people, they are pretty much declared communists, okay? They are not people that believe in Thomas Jefferson and our founding father's principle. That's my problem. And as you can hear from him, this guy said very well, and this was 1996. We pretty much now, we vote. We vote. We are uh, uh, citizens or not, we vote. And look at uh, the, 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 the situation that we have right now, welfare situation that they have in California. They are pretty much uh, directing towards self-destruction. And when you have uh, millions of people uneducated on the basic principle of uh, freedom, as you say, and self-responsibility, these people, they want just to steal, steal, and steal. I'm sorry. Look at the votes. Look at the, the people that they have in, in Congress, I mean, in the House, in, in Sacramento. I mean, that's the reality. Look at the mayor of, of Los Angeles. I mean, they're all political activists from this type of movement called Mesha La Raza. And that's my fear. And I agree with you. If you go to Mexico, you want to do your life, whatever. They don't care. They want just your money. And I understand. And that's fine. Same story here. The problem when you come here and you are, unfortunately, I believe there is a bigger agenda behind. They're using pawns against each other. This is the part of the globalist to create this sort of divide and conquer. And this is the institution that pretty much brainwash uh, this, uh, this generation of uh, people from Mexico to come here with the idea that we need to reconquer, okay? It's part of these international bankers to balkanize this country, and they want to create a global government. Do you agree on global government, or we should keep our own sovereignty? No, we should keep our own sovereignty. But, you know, th these people's mindset, Luca, is no different from your standard Republican mindset. I mean, Republicans believe in control and, and welfare and political stealing and i mean we libertarians we have a big battle against all of these people <laughs> but we battle with our ideas with our philosophy and uh, we don't try to suppress them we don't try to censor them we don't try to say you can't participate in the political process i mean that was one of the downsides to the cold war where the fbi tried to destroy people who were communists or when pinochet killed people who were communists a free society says advocate whatever you want you want to be a communist you have a right to be a communist no, but as libertarians, no. we fight with our ideas and with our philosophy. I agree with you. I agree with you. We have freedom of speech that doesn't say exactly which part we should suppress. There is freedom of speech, period. My only concern now, we are beyond the freedom of speech. This is becoming part of a well-planned invasion. But that's my philosophy. Listen, what do you think? If I want to join the Libertarian Party, uh, you know, we agree pretty much on 90% of the things, you know, CIA, FBI, all this stuff, and NSA, I'm all with you there. Patriot Act, burn everything, start again from scratch. But when it comes down to this, I'm pretty much convicted on my own opinions. Should I be even try to join the Libertarian Party or I'm going to get tomatoes on my face when I come there? No, absolutely not. I mean, the Libertarian Party, anybody can join. And, and most people who join are, are well on the what we call the freedom train. Mm -hmm. uh, they, 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 they may not be accepting every Libertarian principle, but... There are certain, like I say, litmus tests, like the drug war. There's no point joining the, the Libertarian Party if you favor the drug war. Well, I agree with you. Um, I'm completely agree with you. I mean, that's the first thing I learned a long time ago. Uh, you know, this is about, it's not drug wars. It's the drug, it's a war on freedom. It's a war on your body. It's a war on your property. It's a war on the basic principle that the government now owns your body. Jacob, I want to thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, your information, your everything. 
And also, I would like to say one more time, the name of your book, everybody can buy so they can learn and they can make their, their mind. Please say the name of your book and how they can buy it. Yeah, it's the case for free trade and open immigration. We also have lots of other books on Amazon. And uh, come to our website at the Future of Freedom Foundation at FFF.org. And you can see all the books there and uh, learn everything you want about libertarianism on our website. And thank you, Luca. This has been a fantastic interview. I really do appreciate it, and I appreciate your courtesy. Thank you, Jacob. And it's been my pleasure, my honor. And please, guys, don't go away. You're listening to Love Guns and Freedom. And please, you know, this is not a government. I'm not going to point a gun at you to get your money. If you want to support this show in this format, that we can pretty much say whatever we want without corporations telling us what we can say or not, go to my website, lovegunsfreedom.com. There is a beautiful section for my music. That's what I do for a living. Download any of my songs for just 99 cents. Thank you very much, and don't go away, because now we go our number two. It's going to be all about guns, training, and much more. La, 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 la. CD, Love, Guns, and Freedom. 16 powerful songs on one CD from the heart of a patriot. For download or to order the CD, go to www.lovegunsfreedom.com. That's www.lovegunsfreedom.com. Lyrics for your mind. Music for your heart. John Lucazana's new CD, Love, Guns, and Freedom. 